Foundation. Uh, as you all know, because you are following from there, we are now live both on our YouTube channel, our LinkedIn channel and our Facebook channel. And uh, today we're going to talk about a super interesting topic, which is lifelong learning and how to pursue excellence in this field. So what is it? What is it for? Who is it for? And most importantly, what are the excellencies in continued development of knowledge and skills that people experience throughout their lives? Let's go straight to the conversation because I'd like to welcome the distinguished guest speakers and interviewees of today's live. Uh, so thanks for being with us, Ikram Charai, career advisor at Ezit in Morocco. Thanks for being with us, Ikram. Thank you for having me today. I'm so happy to be here and uh, the topic is really interesting. So thank you for, for the choice of the topic too. Thank you very much. And uh, thanks as well to Zan Dapcivic, Chief Executive Officer at Academia College of Short Cycle Higher Education in Slovenia. Thanks for being with us, Zan. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. I hope you're having a fantastic day. A pleasure to be with you. Thank you so much. It will be way more fantastic thanks to this conversation. And uh, welcome as well to my colleague, Maria Vittoria Garnappi, Senior Specialist in Human Capital Development at the European Training Foundation. Thank you for being with us, Maria Vittoria. Thank you, Daria. Good, good afternoon, everybody. I'm also so happy to be with us, uh, with you, and be together for the next hour. Thank you. Thanks a lot. And indeed, like Maria Vittoria just flagged, this conversation will last for the next hour. So wherever you are, just give a message, out a message, let us know where you're from, say hello. And most importantly, if you have any comments and questions and you'd like to interact with our speakers, don't hesitate to do so because we take on board your comments by writing them into the chat. So um, now let's go straight to the uh, conversations and I'd like to uh, begin with uh, Maria Vittoria. Uh, Maria Vittoria, you uh, represent today the European Training Foundation in charge for the ENE network of centers of vocational excellence of which both Ikram and Zan are active members. Um, could you please present the scope of the network and why there is this strong focus also on lifelong learning. Maria Vittoria. Thank you, uh, Daria, for your question. Yeah, indeed, uh, um, in our network, which counts dozens of centers of vocational excellence uh, in the ETF partner countries, but also in the member states, we do care about lifelong learning. It's a crucial component of our work and uh, we cover it uh, through different areas and dimensions, which include uh, aspects like um, work-based learning, uh, uh, school autonomy, uh, social inclusion, digitalization, getting green, entrepreneurship. So we articulated our approach to lifelong learning across different thematic areas. And this is indeed also in line with the European Union approach to key competencies for lifelong learning, which means a progressive approach all through our lives of everybody in the society. So why is it important for us lifelong learning and for the center of vocational excellence? Because uh, our societies and COVID is there to witness and remember to us are subject to continuous changes. So we believe the centers of vocational excellence, like the ones in our ENE network, should be driving this change, should be accompanying every component in the society to find his own way, her own way through a constant updating, upskilling, reskilling of his or her profile, because jobs change, societies change, economies change, and people need to be accompanied all through their life. 
Thank you very much, uh, Maria Vittoria. And uh, indeed, your, your last input on the fact that uh, jobs change, societies change. Uh, I'm sure this will come later in the conversation. I see Zan is nodding. We already had a preliminary chat on this aspect, and I'm sure uh, he will be uh, glad to, to share some of the um, inputs to follow up on, on, on what you just said, um, Maria Vittoria. I'd like to say hello to the first uh, friends and followers who are getting connected. We have Gohan from Ankara in Turkey. We have Aida from Albania, Magdalena from Krakow. Mahendra from uh, India. Um, so please uh, keep on uh, letting us know where you're from and say hi, and we'll bring our, your salutations on board to the speakers. Um, now, uh, going in this exploration of the centers of excellence from uh, uh, Slovenia to Morocco, um, Ikram, let's begin with ladies first. Uh, you are a career advisor at ESIT, Ecole Supérieure des Industries du Textile de l'Habillement, uh, School of Textile and Clothing Industries, which was created as a result of a public-private partnership and designed to grow a key sector in the Moroccan economy. Um, Ikram, who are your students and what do you develop in the field of lifelong learning? We're all curious to know. So, um, EZIT is a higher education school uh, which offers a multitude of programs. Um, uh, we have a category in, in initial training, another category in, um, in uh, uh, courses that are offered to uh, employees who are already working. So in initial training, uh, we have two, uh, two programs, one which is um, uh, vocational education. Uh, and in this program, we have, we have two, you could say two programs also. Uh, one is a, a two-year program that, is, uh, that gives a, um, a degree, a technical degree. Uh, and uh, a second program, which is a bachelor gives a bachelor degree. Both of, both of these degrees are recognized by the Ministry of Vocational Education. And we have another, another program, which is the higher education program. This one offers engineering degrees and master degrees. What's special about this, uh, uh, this program is that it offers the possibility for students who studied in vocational education to join this program and to have a higher education. So, uh, our students are inside EZIT, what they can apply for it, or outside of EZIT from other, from other schools. Uh, and this degree is also recognized by the Ministry of Higher Education. And we have the other program, which, is, uh, uh, which, which caters to the, um, uh, to, the, to the people who are already working in the workforce. And uh, it has uh, two, two categories. Uh, we offer it in two forms. The first one is short courses. These are themed courses uh, that are offered uh, in uh, tailored to the company's needs, like a company. Uh, uh, we, we offer them in the company or here at EZI. These courses are offered uh, anywhere uh, the company wishes. And there is a second program, which is the executive education. Uh, this is a two-year program. And at the end, uh, there is um, a degree, it can be a master degree, that is uh, offered to employees. This is a program that's uh, given on weekends, and the degree is not recognized by the, the Ministry of uh, Education, but it's, it's still a degree. So these are, are, are our students, and this is how we organize our learning and continuous learning. Thank you very much, uh, Ikran. Uh, out of curiosity, how many students do you have at uh, EZIT? Which numbers are we talking about? Here for initial training, there are about 1,300. 1,300. So. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, I see that uh, our followers are uh, growingly active, so I promise to say hello, which I will do. Hello to Mark, to Sarah from Tunisia, to Mark from Lebanon to Nikar from Azerbaijan, Margarita from Bulgaria, Mohamed, Diar from Istanbul, Najib from Casablanca, Biliana from North Macedonia, Abdullahi from Senegal, Aspasia from North Macedonia, and Ali from Libya. I love reading these hellos. <laughs> <laughs> 
best part of all these conversations because it really gives a geographic overview and the geographic interests of the topics we are discussing about. So please keep on uh, engaging with us and also let us know, are you involved in a lifelong learning program? Are you delivering a lifelong learning program? Do you have doubts on how to develop that? Let us know. Um, Zan, thanks for your patience, uh, uh, patience after the ladies. Uh, you are the Chief Executive Offer Officer at the Academia uh, College of Short Cycle for Higher Education, which on your website you define as a, a short cycle education where 40% of the time is spent on work-based learning with a partner company. So same question to you. Who are your students? And what do you develop in the field of lifelong learning? Over to you, Zan. Thank you very much, uh, Daria, for that lovely introduction. And uh, thank you for the previous uh, comments. Uh, I might just give you a brief of a history of uh, what academia is and why we were established, right? So 25 years ago, we are a family-run uh, private college. Uh, and 25 years ago, we were established based on the lifelong learning needs. You know, Slovenia got independent in 1991. Uh, there were, you know, very typical academic institutions in the country, country with no alternatives of professional or, let's say, more, a bit more vocational education. And uh, since a lot of foreign companies started to enter uh, Slovenia or, or were, were in the pro process of uh, privatization, um, uh, they had the need to upskill and reskill the workforce. Mm -hmm. And this is how we established. We started off with so-called FARE programs. And then based on that, we've grown up and, uh, and established a college that is primarily based for, for lifelong learners. So we would work with industry. Usually we, are, we deliver programs around technical education where companies would bring their own uh, staff into, into upskilling or reskilling programs uh, that are publicly accredited as, uh, and they sit on level five as qualifications awarded with 120 ECTS. Uh, but on top of that, we have uh, different programs, you know, uh, also in uh, for, for adult learners. Uh, right now, we are completing one uh, big national project next year uh, where that is specifically targeted for upskilling the, the workforce in Slovenian economy for the needs of Industry 4.0. Uh, the project is called Monera, Monera Free. Uh, this week right now, what we are doing, for example, also we are a part of another national project that targets uh, another uh, very interesting target group of uh, um, elderly workers, uh, so for 50 plus. Uh, and these co programs are very much customized to their needs and the, the, comp the company needs where the people are employed. Um, and on top of that, we have a proper certification happening in Slovenia for adult education run by the Institute of Adult Education in Slovenia, which is a government agency that uh, accredits uh, institutions for adult learning. So, so uh, any, uh, let's say, private or public provider could be an adult learning institution in Slovenia, but they have to follow certain procedures that are a bit more specific for the, for the adult learners and we are proud that we, we are holder of that certificate uh, for, for many, many years already. And that, that would be, in short, very much it. But I would be happy to have questions uh, from, from the audience as well to, to go more into specifics uh, about, about that. Thank you very much. And indeed, we have uh, luckily uh, enough time uh, available to, um, to develop uh, further uh, this topic. Um, I'd like to uh, say hi also to Asghar from Iran, to Havid from uh, Baku, uh, and uh, we we had um, we had a comment um, from our uh, friend Ali Bakir uh, saying we in the National Erasmus Plus office in Libya received many requests regarding cooperation in the field of training and technical education. We would be glad if this opportunity could uh, contribute to uh, the Libyan technical education and related students and staff. Thanks, um, Ali, for uh, engaging with us. And if you have also any specific question for the speakers on how to uh, eventually develop things or anything, don't hesitate to intervene. Um, going back to uh, Maria Victoria. 
uh, because you are not only uh, a member of the uh, NN network of the network team, but uh, you are the lead uh, as far as entrepreneurial skills development is concerned. Uh, now, can you let us know whether entrepreneurial skills development can be considered also an area of action for lifelong learning? And if so, why? Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Daria, for your question. Um, indeed, uh, entrepreneurial skills are essential. I see, I hear Nico. I'll ask all of you, uh, please, Ikram and Zan, if we can all mute ourselves while, uh, while Maria Vittoria speaks. Thank you. Um, yeah, I was saying that entrepreneurship um, and entrepreneurial learning are key for excellence and are key for lifelong learning. Why? Um, in our understanding in ETF, which is in line with the European Union um, approach, entrepreneurship should be understood as a mindset. Every one of us should be entrepreneurial. This does not mean that everyone is meant to be an entrepreneur, meaning setting up a business. But every one of us in the society, in the economy, is called to be entrepreneurial. So what does it mean being entrepreneurial? Being entrepreneurial means to be able to spot opportunities, to mobilize resources, to um, impact in our lives, in the society, in the economy, in our industries, with some change, some change that adds value. So this links up to what we were saying in the beginning, that everything is changing, and each one of us uh, is called to add some value to this change. So entrepreneurship is meant uh, for us uh, as a um, mindset, as an approach. Is, uh, is about uh, being creative, is about uh, taking risks, is about spotting opportunities. It is about uh, working with others. It is about uh, learning how to be better. All these skills can be found uh, in the European Union EntreComp framework, which is a very strong uh, framework that can help teachers and educators to structure their curricula and also to empower their students, be it young people, but be it also older people. We all know about uh, friends and relatives uh, that uh, are maybe at risk of losing their job and they are on the 40s, they are on the 50s and still need to work for their life and for their professional development, but also personal development. So how can we help them? One way is to help them as a center of vocational excellence to empower these people to be more entrepreneurial, less shy in putting forward their ideas. Some of these ideas may become uh, new businesses, but we know that not more than 10% of the population is meant or has the right attitude to be an entrepreneur. On the contrary, everybody should be entrepreneurial. So this is what uh, uh, we promote uh, in ENE. We have a specific project on that, and uh, we are working also with EZIT on this project. And it is about to empower Center of Vocational Excellence to be more entrepreneurial. Um, I, I hope I replied to your question, but I'm available here. Uh, and if I may, uh, Daria, uh, for our friend in Libya, uh, yes. if I may address also this comment and uh, Ali, uh, I would like to, to say, to share with you that for Libya, we have a country liaison officer in ETF, is a colleague of mine, his name is Munir Bati, but if you contact ETF, you will be put in touch with Munir and you can see what you can do with the ETF for Libya and in Libya. Thank you. Thank you very much, Maria Vittoria. And I kindly ask uh, my colleagues who are helping out with managing uh, technically this conversation, if uh, they can uh, send a message to our Libyan 
uh, friend uh, with uh, the contact uh, details of our country officer, so to facilitate the contact. Um, now I'd like to surprise uh, speakers all the time with questions which were not foreseen. So following up with uh, what Maria Vittoria just said about uh, entrepreneurial skills, such as the ability to spot opportunities, being creative, etc. Is this something that one can learn at school? And if so, how? Would you have any examples, Ikram and Zan? Who would like to take the floor? Ikram, is it you trying to put the mic on? Yes. <laughs> Over to you. Thank you. Um, so I, I think it is possible to learn uh, to be to learn to be entrepreneur at school. It's, uh, there are a variety of programs that can be offered uh, to, to students, not only uh, via uh, academia. I, I've seen that, uh, I see that all the time uh, in front of me with students where they jo join clubs. I think uh, it's extracurricular activities uh, give the chance to, uh, to students to develop their entrepreneurial side uh, outside of the uh, outside of the classroom, so I think it's one way to to do it. <laughs> Thank you very much, Ikram. Um, and uh, I don't know if Zan is willing to add something on this. Yes, maybe I, I can share very briefly what, what we do. So in, in every in every program that that lasts for two years at Academia, students are obliged to 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 do an entrepreneurship course, right? Uh, in their fields of study. It doesn't have to be really much entrepreneurship. It can be also a lot in, about intrapreneurship, you know, so doing some innovation within their existing organizations. And also their research projects on the end have to be very, very much innovative in, and applied to solve a certain problem. And uh, on top of that, they have to be, uh, how I would say, uh, uh, valued in terms of economics, right? What kind of value that will bring to the organizations they're working in or with the venture they will create. So, so I, I mean, I'm happy to share that uh, one, one out of five graduates from academia are entrepreneurs. You know, uh, we, even though we are a college of short cycle higher education, uh, we don't bring in the, the brightest and the smartest uh, uh, students, you know, because this is not the goal of our institution. But we would we would create so-called lifestyle entrepreneurs, you know, and on average they would be employing between two to three people, or be self-employed. Uh, and on top of that, we of course have some record, uh, rec uh, you know, people that are doing some records. You know, we have a company that has more than 200 employees right now uh, from our graduates. You know, so so we can definitely uh, we should definitely you know encourage that in in the curriculum already. But I cannot agree more what what Ikram has said as well in terms of extracurricular activities. And just generally the setting, you know, and the mode of delivery of the of the programs or, or or the setting of the campus and activities that are around it, you know, uh, there are small pieces usually that you know, that can trigger entrepreneurship, and we can connect these dots together. We can create some beautiful stories. Thank you very much, Zan. Uh, and I think it's about time to uh, take on board uh, the question of one of our uh, followers uh, from Iran, if I'm not mistaken. Um, how do you integrate soft skills and entrepreneur sk entrepreneurial skills development in TVET excellence? Um, Zan, would you like to uh, take it first and then Ikram, if you want to follow up? Sure, I think I think that's that's a great question. I've seen I've seen it in the chat to, to pop up before, uh, and uh, it, it is probably the hardest question to answer because uh, my my personal belief I don't know if I'm correct on that, but my personal belief is that it comes down to the mode of study and mode of assessment that creates the environment to de for development of soft skills, right? So we can't have an exam problem solving, but we can set an environment with a specific specific knowledge or technical knowledge in which students can can attain it through problem solving right so it's all about the mode uh, and design of the assessment and the delivery that that creates uh, that kind of environment and i think this is probably if we if if i can look it from the director perspective or the ceo perspective this is also probably the most costly way of educating right because we have to you know invest so much to ensure that the design is correct that it's personalized to a specific need of a specific student uh, to 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 actually grow this kind of soft skills as well thank you very much zan would you have anything uh, to add ikram from your perspective in morocco 
Yes, um, I think I do agree that soft skills is very important uh, uh, today. And one of the, I, I do agree with Zan that that's one way to, to do it. But um, here from our experience, what we do here is we have a career center here in Ezid. And in the career center, we, we have uh, coaching sessions where we help uh, we try to identify uh, where our students need more help in terms of uh, soft skills and we can uh, uh, help them develop them in terms of communication or uh, public speaking or whatever so soft skills they, they, might, they might need. So that can be a, a way to, uh, to help them develop their, their soft skills. Thank you very much. Uh, I hope that uh, we have uh, answered the question of our kind uh, friend from Iran. Uh, if you'd like to follow up, don't hesitate to uh, send another message in the chat. And to all of you who are following this conversation, because I see that you are uh, many uh, all over the globe, uh, please send your questions uh, if you have uh, any, any, any further one. Um, Ikram and Zan, now I have uh, the same question to, to both of you. Uh, if you could please share, because we have the principle and the idea that uh, sharing best practices can always be a way to inspire uh, everyone. Uh, could you please share some examples of uh, well-functioning lifelong learning activities which you are implementing in your centers? And what do you think are the key success factors? Who'd like to take the floor first? Um, yeah. Uh, so, so here, here at uh, Ezit, we we are we tailor uh, to the um, to tailor our programs to the industrial sector, and we know in the industrial sector, it, it's uh, there is innovation all the time and it's changing all the time. So we need to change uh, to update the skills of our workforce in order for them to be able to keep up with with the change. Uh, so one way of doing that is by offering short courses to uh, to our to our staff, uh, and the, these courses are offered all over the year, all, all the year or year long, and uh, it's it's theme based. So they take courses depending on their on their specialty and their their needs, and uh, their needs are assessed every year. And every day they express. Uh, their, what, what do they need in terms of in terms of training? And these trainings uh, are going hand hand in hand with the companies with the school strategy. So uh, is it uh, has has uh, the, the training needs assessed every year and it's aligned them with the strategy and it's, they're offered to the to the company to the employees. These employees, uh, meaning us. We are aware of the strategy of the company, and the needs we um, we express are also in the in line with the strategy. So I can give an example. Uh, for example, a few years back, uh, Ezi decided to delete a program, uh, training program, and the teaching staff who was in the training program had to to go through a reskilling and learn new skills in order to teach in other programs. Uh, so. That was uh, uh, one way uh, of uh, dealing with uh, the change in, in, the, in the workforce and in the, in the work environment. Uh, there's also another, another way uh, that uh, is it adopts, uh, which is um, a program is called Recognition of Acquired Experiential Learning, meaning our, our, our technicians have now the opportunity to, to uh, upgrade their degrees and get higher education degrees, and some of them uh, get PhDs. Uh, they move from a technical, technical degree to a PhD degree through this program. Uh, and uh, uh, the, uh, the school empowers these employees to, to do this, and we're all the time encouraged to, uh, uh, to go through this program and update our, our skills. Thank you very much, uh, Ikram. Um, would you have any uh, example of uh, well-functioning activities, Zan, from Slovenia? Yeah, f thank you. Thank you for that question. Very, very, very important topic because you know adult adult learners are, are very much different from, let's say, young learners in, in that respect. 
Uh, I mean, what we've learned throughout the years is that, you know, uh, of course, the, the mode of study, I think, that has to be a bit more adjusted to the to the adult learners in terms of how many courses are delivered at the time. You know, we are, we are, for example, in Slovenia following a modular way of delivering the course. So we we don't go semester by semester. We, we actually go course or two courses by two courses, which is a very much a Dutch model of the delivery. Um, and then, of course, you know, the, the assessment as such, you know, we try to bring as, as much as vocational context we call it uh, so that you know uh, not only is uh, is uh, assessment a bit more clear to to the uh, to the learners but also that you know they can apply it at the job as soon as possible right so the idea is that they can really go out once they finish from the school and apply as much knowledge as possible on the on the spot um, and uh, and of course you know we we start off with so-called preparatory courses you know even though you know uh, our students and uh, learners have completed uh, high school education uh, but the, some let's say five or ten years or twenty years has passed right so unfortunately the knowledge that they present with the high school diplomas has somehow you know either expired on one hand but on the other hand they bring in some knowledge that has not been formalized right throughout their workforce experience so we need to calibrate this at the beginning of the year and we do it through so-called uh, uh, preparatory courses in in some basic skills we were talking about ict skills you're talking about numerical skills for engineering programs as well as language uh, language uh, foreign language skills as well uh, and, and these are these are some of the ways that that we that we tend to tend to do it. But of course, you know, motivation. Uh, I think it's uh, much our experience that motivation with adult learners is much higher usually. Uh, but what what keeps that motivation and self motivation is inspiration and teamwork, basically by by the cohort, right? So we try to create as much as possible informal events and informal uh, opportunities together with fellow students and also with the with the with the teaching staff and the faculty to ensure that they they really make a strong cohort together you know so they start together and they finish off together and that really pushes the whole group forward you know and uh, you can see a lot of you know help and collaboration happening in if it's not formalized through the assessment then in the informal way of uh, uh, studying you know thank you very much sunny it's like uh, creating uh, some sort of a community as well Correct, exactly, indeed, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Um, I'd like to take on board one comment and one question. There is a comment from Najib, um, which we, we know well. Hello, Najib, entrepreneurship education, uh, be it embedded in the curriculum or in extracurricular activities is a booster of soft skills. Thank you for your comment, uh, Najib. And if I remember well, there is also a question by Sarah Ben-Nazir. Uh, what activities could be implemented? Oops, I've lost it. What activities could be uh, implemented to promote the VET skills and raise the attractiveness of VET? This is a point which is very well at the heart of uh, the action of the European Training Foundation. So uh, I'm totally open to who would like to pick uh, the floor first, take the floor first. The fastest will be? Yes, I'll, I'll go with them. Uh, it, it's actually a perfect question. I think it's something to be solved also through through the through the Erasmus calls, right? On the on the platforms of central uh, of the excellences in uh, VET, right? Um, but I mean, what, what we do, for example, in Slovenia, on, on the level five, at least, we, we are 48 colleges that are combined into association. And the association has the role to promote the VET uh, on level five in that respect. And we do a lot of analysis. I also sit on the board of the association. And for example, uh, the best way to prove it for people is, you know, to sure what are the outcomes, right? And uh, outcomes can be measured in terms of unemployment rate, uh, in terms of salary. Uh, so usually, you know, there are two objectives why to go against that. It's that, you know, students aren't earning enough or graduates aren't earning enough or they, they aren't getting the right jobs or they aren't getting jobs at all. So in Slovenia, for example, we have proven that they our graduates on the level five level uh, enter the job market on average three times faster than the bachelor peers. 
and in more than half of the regions already in Slovenia, they earn on average a higher salary than a bachelor degree uh, graduate. And uh, this has proven, you know, that uh, those graduates are valuable by the um, uh, by the employers. And, uh, you know, we can definitely use that data to, to promote that. And uh, we see already some uh, growth in that respect in terms of enrollments overall in Slovenia. And uh, uh, yeah, and we are making uh, you know that great again. We would say, you know. <laughs> so. <laughs> Thank you. Zan. And um, Ikram, what's the situation like uh, in uh, in Morocco? Do you see um, that uh, that is unattractive? Uh, is there a work to make it more attractive? How would you uh, take Sarah's question uh, on board? I think here, here uh, in Morocco, there is uh, there is an attractiveness to the vet centers uh, already because we see it's it's a trend. Everybody is uh, is going uh, for uh, for an extra uh, degree and uh, uh, extra training. And I agree with Dan. It's a very very good idea to to share success stories and of our of our graduates and how they changed their career how they earn better how uh, they advanced in their career so this i think uh, we should work more on on communication if you want to attract more uh, uh, students and uh, encourage them to uh, to proceed with the, with the new uh, new degree i think it's it's a good idea to work on the communication and share more stories success stories Thank you very much, Ikram. And being myself a communication professional, I cannot be happier than that uh, as regards to what you just said. Um, and uh, part of uh, the, the, the sharing and then in, in, in increasing the attractiveness of that is also uh, showcasing the, the best stories and the excellencies such as the ones that you are representing. And this is also one of the reasons why the N network was created. Isn't that the case, Maria Victoria? And yes. What if someone is willing to join the network? How does the access to the network work in practice? Thank you, Daria. Um, I would like just to add uh, one thing uh, to what was said by the other speakers, uh, in the sense that this issue of vet attractiveness is a big one, especially in some countries. Uh, where despite uh, some efforts, uh, the percentage of students in VET uh, is still quite low uh, if we consider the needs of, of the economy, uh, of the enterprises for certain profiles. So I think um, uh, I totally agree with Zan. <laughs> it's about employability. I mean, if VET doesn't help to enter the labor market, it's not attractive. I totally agree with Ikram about communication because you have to communicate the success. I may maybe add a couple of, um, of points. One is the need to study constantly, uh, monitor the needs of the enterprises. This might seem uh, to be something obvious, but this is not done regularly everywhere. And since the needs are changing constantly, it's very important that VET is not outdated in its provision. It's very important that the, the methods, pedagogical methods, be it entrepreneurial or not, or other, be it the content hmm, of the training, be it the fields where VET is offered, is updated. So you need to monitor, to have a constant touch and a constant exchange with the ecosystem be it in enterprises, but not only, because we know it's about self-employed people as an opportunity for work. We know about entrepreneurship as a business startup, but also the public sector is employing and also the public sector needs uh, qualified um, and up-to-date uh, profiles of, of workers. So this is the first thing I would like to add. The second one is that in some countries, uh, for cultural reason, that uh, is not very much appreciated. Huh? It's seen as a second chance vis-a-vis uh, -vis academic uh, education. 
So I think in that case, there is also a need for some campaign huh, to inform the population that maybe some university degrees are not requested by the labor markets. There is an over offer of that. Whereas there are very dignitous, high level jobs linked to technology that can be obtained through VET. But this needs some communication campaign, not only on good practices, but also to, to, to open a bit the, how can I say, especially into parents' minds, because sometimes youth are much more uh, flexible and open, but also in the parents' mind that that is a very dignitous way of uh, gaining a good work and a good life. Concerning your question, indeed, as Ene, we welcome we welcome um, centers of vocational excellence in ETF partner countries to join us, and also from the member states. So please, if you want to know more about our network. Uh, you can access it uh, through the um, address uh, that is uh, shown now on the screen. You may also contact us by email. You will find an email now in the chat. And we will organize a dedicated meeting with your Center of Vocational Excellence to see how we can cooperate together. Uh, one last thing, maybe, uh, Daria, is that uh, we need to, to, to remember everyone that we work in a certain number of countries. And um, I'm sorry for Iran, now is not yet. This was one question in the chat. Uh, ETF is not currently working in Iran, but we work from Morocco to Syria, Northern Africa, Middle East. We work in the Western Balkans and Turkey. We work in... Eastern Europe, and we work in Central Asia. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and uh, I'd like to add that to all those who are following this conversation and uh, are not uh, part of, of, of some countries in which uh, the ETF currently uh, mainly operates, uh, still can join the Open Space Community, which is a worldwide community for all those who are active and interested in the learning field. And uh, my colleagues, I'm sure, Iguala, the super helpful and reactive are showing the address so uh, to our friends from Iran, uh, from Pakistan, I saw from India, please do join this community because it's a very valuable place to exchange inputs. Um, following up on uh, one point which, um, which was flagged by, by many of you and, um, and uh, reminded by, by Maria Vittoria now on the need uh, to constantly monitor uh, the changes, the changing needs of the enterprises. Um, I think it would be very nice for, for all of us to know a bit more about the territory, uh, the, 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 the economic uh, and social landscape of the places in which your schools are placed. I had a short discussion about this with Zan. I did not know much about Maribor. I've learned it has similarities to the city where I was born. So maybe Zan, can you let us know how your center fits well with a completely changing and evolving market in Maribor. Correct. I think that's a, that's a very good point. Um, uh, I mean, you know, I, I believe vet centers are always a reflection of the ecosystem around it, right? We are just one, one, one part in the, in the triangle, so to speak, right? Uh, um, connecting to, to, to the real economy, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and for example, you know, uh, as I said, you know, Slovenia got independent in the 1990s. Maribor used to be, is the second largest uh, town in Slovenia. It, it, it always used to be very much known as industrial town, uh, but since the independence, you know, all the factories pretty much got shut down because they lost uh, a huge market in ex Yugoslavia and they had to, uh, you know, readapt for, for the Western market and they weren't ready in terms of technology, in terms of labor force skills and et cetera, et cetera. So that was the first need for, for first upskilling. And right now what we're going is basically the second phase, you know, where where we are seeing a lot of automation, a lot of industry 4.0 happening, you know, and this is a, a, again another change, you know, major change for the whole for the whole city uh, and the whole region around it, right? Uh, and uh, I believe, you know, once once we see these kind of changes, we as education institutions need to adapt as well. I mean, we started off as a uh, as a school providing trainings in in uh, very much soft skills in ICT foreign languages, and then converted more into business a school of business. 
but now we are very much focused and then the second phase was maybe in more in, in engineering uh, very technical field of engineering but now we are seeing that we are about to digitalize everything what we deliver right uh, in terms of uh, and actually empower empower all the programs with much of uh, automatization, digitalization, industry 4.0. And we are seeing this in construction, we are seeing this in automotive engineering, we are seeing this in accounting and finance, you know, uh, to ensure that we equip students with the right skills uh, and to ensure that the, what they are learning is not gonna get automated very soon. So, I mean, Slovenia, unfortunately, uh, has a very bad position in, in European Union, uh, or actually across the OECD countries. I think there was one report produced by PwC on the risk of automatization of jobs. And Slovenia is placed as second among OECD countries. So roughly around 50% of jobs in Slovenia that are currently existing have the risk of uh, automatization in the next 10 years. And this, is, uh, this has been accelerated now with the pandemic of coronavirus. And uh, we have to adapt and be very fast in order to stay competitive you know, among, among the nations around the world. And uh, this is also our role, what we need to do. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, Zan. And I'm uh, curious to know more also about uh, uh, the ACID case in the uh, Casablanca area and uh, Morocco, how has eventually the, uh, the, the center um, evolved over the time uh, according also to changes in, in the uh, local, uh, local or global economy, affecting local economy? Yes, we, we, have, we have indeed adopted. Uh, you know, Morocco positions itself as the hub uh, for for Africa, so that's why we we have a lot of uh, uh, industrial companies who are relocating to Morocco, and this actually serves us well because we cater to the industrial sector. So we we are all the time uh, trying to adapt to the to the new new trends in the market, uh, uh, adding new new degrees, updating the, the existing degrees. Uh, I agree with Zan. It's um, uh, right now automation and uh, digital world is uh, is a must. We have to digitalize all of our uh, uh, platforms and our, uh, uh, our our what we offer as as degrees. So uh, that's why lately we we have we have also uh, added new degrees in order to keep up with this new trend and uh, to equip our students to work in the industrial sector. Uh, uh, here in Casablanca, we have a lot of companies, industrial companies who are, who are uh, uh, relocating to Casablanca. Uh, we have also companies relocating to the north of the, of the country. Uh, and there's another region also near Casablanca. So our, our students are very well served in, uh, in, in job opportunities right now. For, for the moment, uh, the, the market trend is working well for us. <laughs> And we are very pleased with that, uh, Ikram. And congratulations on on uh, what you are both doing in uh, in your in your respective uh, countries. Uh, I'd like to pick up the comment of uh, Jan, uh, who is uh, following us from LinkedIn. Thank you, Jan. He's writing that open space is a great network and always a nice discovery of the different initiatives. Thank you, Jan. We cannot be happier than that by reading your comment. And I invite again all of you to join. Um, we are approaching the end of uh, this uh, conversation. So um, I'd like to ask you, uh, what processes do you put in place so as to make sure that continuing education is always at the best standards as possible? Are there regular assessments? Are there specific resources in terms of people? Uh, concretely, how do you make this happen? Zan, maybe over to you first. Yes, that's uh, that's an excellent, uh, again, another excellent question, you know, and this is something that's been at heart of our institution because when we started off, we said, okay, how, how are we going to ensure that we, we stay we stay on top, right? Uh, as, as the management with lecture staff and faculty and uh, students. Uh, I mean, one, one couple of very concrete examples. What we started off was standardization of processes and, uh, and activities within the college. And we, we used ISO standards for that prior to, prior to European standard guidelines that were existing for the quality assurance in, in higher education space in, in, uh, in Europe. Uh, now, of course, we use those. Uh, but more importantly, uh, what we do is we... Uh, we, we conduct uh, with our uh, regulator from the UK, which we signed up for a couple of years ago. 
uh, that we conduct so-called external visits uh, where they sample student work uh, and they provide expertise whether you know the student work that is produced inside the college uh, meets first vocational context so that we are really doing something very much applied with students and second of all that it is at the appropriate level uh, so of um, of uh, let's say requirements as well as that we have uh, uh, the the correct uh, correct and up-to-date knowledge so so what we do is we, we set up so-called uh, annual teams uh, you know let, let it be uh, uh, climate change or let it be uh, digitalization or new technologies in construction, for example, and then students would work around these cover teams to, to develop research projects, you know, and we had some excellent, you know, uh, research projects around the use of robotics, drones, etc., and new materials, for example, in construction. And this has really pushed, you know, the whole institution and the stakeholders to work together and, and stay up to date, uh, you know, continuously, you know, annually. It's not a one-off time uh, thing to do with external reviews, but we do it annually with every program, which is very, very demanding on one hand, but uh, it's on the other hand, also very much rewarding for, for graduates and employers. Thank you very much also for plugging the, the role of research, even in the, in the field and even more uh, in the field of uh, developing better lifelong learning um, services. Um, Ikram, uh, what processes do you put in place at ZIT uh, so as to uh, keep up with the better stand, best standards as possible? Uh, so uh, here I, I would like to talk about what we do for our internal employees and what we do for uh, uh, external our st external students for the the ongoing we, we have an ongoing department uh, ongoing education department uh, for corporate uh, relations. Um, so for the, for internal employees, we have the HR department that handles um, that handles the, the trainings, and uh, for this also we have a quality assurance uh, process that uh, the HR department follows, and uh, in order to assure the quality of the uh, of the training sessions that is offered to the to the internal staff. Uh, the, the same thing for for the um, uh, for the ongoing education uh, center that uh, that offers uh, um, education uh, ongoing education to uh, to employees from uh, outside of Egypt. So uh, this also follows um, a quality assurance uh, standard procedure that we have put in place. We have also ass assessment tools that guarantees uh, the, the quality of the, the, the learning experience of the, the students. Uh, and um, uh, all of this is, is, is uh, monitored every year in order to assure the, the quality of the, uh, of the services that are offered to, the, to these employees. Thank you very much, Ikram. I'm sure that uh, this very, um, very practical description of how you uh, put in place uh, excellence uh, is, a, is of great interest for uh, everyone who is following. We really have uh, five more minutes uh, before we close, and I'd like to uh, take on board uh, Abdullah Esal com comment who says, uh, to meet the challenge of employability in Africa, some countries have started to deploy higher education institutes geared towards uh, vocational training. The Association for the Development of Education in Africa supports such initiatives uh, and Abdullah is willing to connect. Uh, so thanks Abdullah for uh, presenting what, uh, what you're doing and uh, congratulations. Um, sorry, just let me quickly uh, scroll um, a bit. Just give me one second. Um, and then we have uh, another comment by Najib, um, who is saying, in my opinion, going back to the soft skills, are not uh, a one package of skills. Those who build curriculum should define what soft skills they want to teach, considering the nature of the programs they offer. For example, soft skills for humanities can be different from those needed in engineering. Very valid point, Najib. Thank you for flagging that. Um, then um, there is uh, ah, there is one question which I think is uh, is very interesting to close the conversation. And before that, I just say also hello to 
I think the friend following from far away, the, from more far away, from Sumba Island in Indonesia. Thank you, uh, Blue Frem, for being with us. Um, let's close, uh, if you agree, with a question from Sarah Benzir. So, which are the best uh, uh, issues to, which are the best ways, I assume, to assure the recognition of the outcomes of all forms of lifelong learning? So, how can we uh, be sure then that then uh, that people are have learned for real, and that that is also something which qualifies them for future jobs. Zan. Oh, that's 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 a hard question. <laughs> <laughs> but 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 I'll I'll try I'll try to answer what what's my personal view on that. You know, I mean, we we all know like how 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 our brains function. You know, in terms of what we can remember. And probably what we can what we remember in from today's school in, in tomorrow and the week after that and a month after that and how 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 this memory erupts right so uh, that 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 presents a key question you know whether whether any qualifications that are awarded are really you know valid in the in the infinity in terms of time right uh, and I've seen a very interesting example coming from one of the uh, business schools in Norway where they have limited they put the expiry date on their on their uh, diplomas and degrees and uh, qualifications and with only with lifelong learning can you remain uh, entitled to a qualification and that's a very interesting uh, model that i have uh, observed and i think we might actually have i hope we'll have something like that in the future because only with that we will really promote the lifelong learning uh, and ensure that you know people that are represented by certain qualifications are a reflection of, of who they are. Thank you, Zan. I think we're all shaking from the idea of our diplomas being expiring, but I, I totally um, take uh, on board your the, the point and this great example you've just flagged, because this is precisely what would push even more people to uh, engage further in lifelong learning. Uh, Ikram, would you have anything to add on the, the point? Yes, uh, I do agree with that. I'd, I'd add uh, that uh, it is already expired. I mean, our, our degrees have expired. Uh, and uh, some jobs are going to, to get deleted from the job market, which means even the degrees are not going to be relevant anymore in the future. So uh, it, it, it means that lifelong learning is, uh, is inevitable. P for people to, be, to stay relevant, they will have to keep learning and to, to keep uh, uh, adding new skills to their to their CV because if uh, if you uh, if one person wants to to work with only one degree and keep keep only uh, one one set of skills it's not going to to work anymore especially with the context of uh, uh, of the pandemic today we've, we've seen how uh, many jobs got cancelled how people were forced to change jobs because they lost their jobs so. Uh, if we have this culture of long life learning, we, we nobody would have an issue in changing career every five five years or ten years. Or so yeah, it would, it's interesting to keep to keep learning. Thank you very much. And one last word with Maria Vittoria. So a way to solve these expiry date is keep on being entrepreneurial, isn't it? Yeah, one, one way is that. But uh, on the positive side, I would like to say that we are constantly learning. For instance, during the pandemic, we all became more digital. I mean, I speak for myself, for sure, and for many people I know. Uh, so to say that there is also learning that is happening out of school. OK, so um, to reply to Sara, um, I think we should empower in all countries mechanisms for validation of non-formal and informal learning as well. So, of course, there are um, um, contents, skills, attitudes that you learn at school, but there are others that you learn outside school. And this is also lifelong learning. So we should uh, uh, find ways to integrate uh, the non-formal, informal, and formal learning uh, so that it's all recognized and, and give value and credit to the people's efforts. Thank you. Thank you very much, Maria Vittoria, indeed, from, uh, from opening up uh, further the, the perspective of the discussion. And uh, with the conversation, we've just uh, are just about to conclude. Uh, this is 
the last Learning Collects live interview as part of uh, the monthly campaign organized by European Training Foundation on lifelong learning. But we'll start next week with a new campaign focusing on resilience. And I invite all of you to join in uh, future conversations on all our platforms. And um, I'd like to thank all of you for having followed this conversation and participated actively. And thanks most of all to the distinguished speakers, Ikram Charai, career advisor at EZIT in Morocco. Thanks, Ikram. Thank you, thank you for having us today, and uh, I, I hope we'll, uh, we'll talk again in the future. I hope, also hope the same, and we'll all, I think, uh, be in touch um, and organize other uh, public conversations as such, maybe even wider ones. Uh, thanks to Zan Dapcevic, Chief Executive Officer at Academia College of Short Cycle Higher Education in Slovenia. Thank you, Zan. Thank you very much for the invitation. It's been a great pleasure and I hope to, to see everyone soon. Uh. Yes, we're missing live uh, um, uh, face to face uh, meetings as well. And thanks a lot to Maria Vittoria Garlappi, Senior Specialist in Human Capital Development at the European Training Foundation. Thanks a lot, Maria Vittoria. Thank you. Thank you all. It was really interesting. Thank you. And thanks a million to my colleagues who have helped with uh, the technicalities of this conversation, in uh, particular uh, Maria, uh, Luigi and Alistair. And thanks a lot to all of you and see you next week. Learning Connects. Bye-bye. Bye-bye now. Bye.